saw how one can work with the dot product when we're dealing with Euclidean vectors, right? It was most, mostly in the nature of recall. Now we're going to look at how some of these ideas can be generalized. So we will, we will uh, introduce the notion of a scalar product of vectors in a linear vector space. Okay, so before we do that, so let's uh, point out that there is something called a dual vector space. So whenever you have a vector, when you define a linear vector space, automatically a dual vector space gets defined, right? So you have x, y, so on, let them be, you know, these ket vectors as we call them, they, they form some linear vector space v. So the notation, you know, these are called bra vectors, right? So these angular brackets are pointing the, the left direction, right? So these vectors, so for every ket vector, there is also a bra vector, right? Which belongs in a dual space. Now, uh, so there is one-to-one -one correspondence between vectors in the two spaces. And so importantly, whenever you take some some vector in the catch space and multiply it by a complex number, right? So of course the basic uh, uh, requirements of you know it being a vector space implies that this alpha times x is also a vector which lies in the same space. Now, but the vector corresponding to this vector alpha x which lies in the dual space is going to be alpha star of this bra vector x, right? So this conjugate, this complex conjugate is an important part of this you know, setup, right? So we will we will see how this plays out as we go along. So in general, if you have some linear combination of ket vectors, alpha x plus beta y, the dual vector corresponding to this is going to be alpha star bra x plus beta star bra y vector, right? So we will use this sort of at an operational level, right? We don't. Uh, you know, make it any more abstract than it needs to be. So let's think of this as a, you know, as a given. There is a dual space where all these vectors are defined and then we will see how, you know, the, the notion of a scalar product that we will introduce now is intimately connected to this dual vector space. And I mean, it will appear later on in many of the manipulations that we will do. So we will learn to work with this space, this dual ve vector space. Okay, so how, so we said that the dot product of, uh, you know, two Euclidean vectors, right, we, we wrote down their properties. So based on those properties, we're going to come up with a prescription for a scalar product between two vectors. So let's say that, you know, x and y are two ket vectors which belong in some linear vector space V. And we want to find the scalar product between these two vectors x and y and here it is denoted by this, you know, this bracket notation. Uh, you know, this inner product is, is denoted as, you know, the bra vector y acting on the ket vector x. So this is in fact where the, uh, the nomenclature of bra, bra and ket comes from because it looks like a bracket. And so Dirac said, okay, so we will look at vectors which, you know, appear on the left side. We'll call them bra vectors and those which, uh, uh, vectors which appear on the right side we'll call the ket vectors, right? So this is where the nomenclature comes from. Now, we define this scalar product of these two vectors to be some complex number, subject to the following properties. First is, you know, if you take the, the scalar product of x with y, it's going to be related to the scalar product of the vector y with x, but they're not exactly the same in general, right? So in fact, we are going to only require that one of them is the complex conjugate of the other, right? So we will see in a moment why, you know, it's not possible to make it a, you know, harder constraint and make it completely symmetric like, like it was possible with, um, you know, Euclidean vectors, right? So the scalar product of x with y is going to be the scalar product of y with x, you know, with a complex conjugate operation performed on top of this. And th the distributive law is very important, so we will require that. So if z is some, you know, alpha x plus beta y, and then if you're going to take the scalar, uh, scalar product 
with uh, with w right with the, the the bra w coming in so you you get this expression so w x z is equal to alpha w x plus beta times the inner product between w and y like here and then we also have this very important requirement that the inner product of any vector with itself must be greater than or equal to zero right so but i mean we just said that you know the inner product of two vectors is going to be a complex number so does it even make sense to demand some something like greater than or equal to zero right so a complex number is um, you know you cannot say things like a one complex number is greater than something else right so you can only talk of this if this quantity is a real number so in fact we will show you know immediately we will show that already we have put in enough constraints that the inner product of a vector with itself is automatically real right first of all it's real already follows from what we have said so far and in addition to it being real we also require that it must be greater than or equal to zero right why do we do this so this is because it will allow us to think of or to define the notion of a you know the equivalent of a length for a vector so we have seen that you know with 3d vectors or euclidean vectors you can take the dot product of a vector with itself and this has the interpretation of its magnitude square right so we want something like that here and that is only possible if this quantity is positive definite right and it's going to be zero only for the null vector right so these are all these are the three requirements for you know some quantity to be a scalar product right so there is actually more than one way in which you could define a scalar product for a uh, you know set of vectors in a vector space as long as these three properties are satisfied it's a it's an acceptable scalar product okay so now let me give you the argument for why why you know we cannot make this symmetric we cannot hardwire a requirement like vector uh, the scale product of x with y is the same as the scale product of y with x right because these are complex numbers right so and so you know the main reason is that we would like the inner product of a vector with itself to be a real number right and not only a real number it should be greater than or equal to zero and that can be forced only if you have this complex conjugate right so let's look at the argument for this suppose you have a vector z which is the linear combination of two vectors x x and y right you could have some coefficients there but doesn't matter let's just take it to be x plus y now if i take an inner product of z with itself so i have the inner product of z with z is equal to inner product of x with x plus inner product of y with y plus inner product of x with y plus inner product of y with x so now if i demand that each of these quantities you know inner product of z with z x with x and y with y they are all real right for you know this idea of its magnitude to be encoded in these quantities they all have to be real if i demand this then it forces you know this quantity the inner product of x with y plus the inner product of y with x to be real and this will not be compatible with with a symmetric definition if i just demanded that x y must be equal to y x and this quantity should be real that will happen only if the inner product of x with y will be a real number right so that's not going to be sufficient right one of uh, uh, you know in general this inner product is going to be a complex number so there are certain uh, you know special vector spaces right the real vector spaces where that can happen right we will look at such cases and in which case anyway the complex conjugate of a real number will just reduce to itself so there is no issue there coming in the other direction but in general if you have a complex number for this to to be you know compatible with every inner product of any vector with itself to be real we must you know it will work out if you demand you know x the inner product of x with y is equal to the complex conjugate of the inner product of y with x right so that's so if if this uh, condition holds then automatically you're guaranteed that the inner product of any vector with itself is 
got to be real. And then on top of that, we also have this requirement that it must be greater than or equal to zero. Why do we do that? That's because it will allow us to define something called the norm of a vector, right? So which is what I said, it's, it's like the magnitude of a vector. So the norm of a vector x is, is defined to be this quantity square root of the inner product of this vector with itself. It's, it's completely analogous to your norm, modulus of a vector a in Euclidean space. Now, again, drawing from our experience with three-dimensional vectors, we will say that two vectors in this, you know, uh, abstract linear vector space, they are orthogonal to each other if the scalar product between them is zero, right? So, and also, you know, something which follows from all this discussion so far is if you have some arbitrary linear combination, alpha x plus beta y for some ket vector z, then if you were to take the inner product of z with some other ket vector w, right, with, with you know, the z vector uh, going into the brass space. So then you have z w, the, the inner product z w is the same as the inner product w z with a conjugate, complex conjugate uh, on top of it, which is the same as alpha star, right. So this alpha star is very important. And this is something that you, uh, you know, you, you practice with these quantities and then it becomes automatic. But, you know, when you're seeing it for the first time, then this is a place where people get confused. So pay attention to when you go from the ket space to the bra space. So there is always these conjugates for coefficients involved, right? You have to be careful. So alpha star xw plus beta star yw. And so we say that, you know, uh, this inner product yx is linear in x, but it's actually antilinear in y. So this antilinear simply means that you have to do these complex conjugates when there are these coefficients involved. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. So, so I said that as long as these three properties hold, you know, you can define your complex number corresponding to any two vectors in more than one way. So let's look at how for some vector spaces that we have already seen, how we can define, um, come up with the idea of a scalar product. So let's consider the set of complex numbers itself, I said is a vector space, right? We have seen that they form a vector space with the operation of addition being the usual addition of complex numbers. So now we can define, so the ket vector z1 is simply something that you associate with a complex number z1, right? And so if you, if you find, if you define the inner product of two complex numbers, you know, the vectors corresponding to two complex numbers z1 and z2 like here. So I can define it as z1 star times z2. And we can readily verify that all these properties are satisfied, you know, first of all. So if I take z2, z1, of course, it's going to become the complex conjugate. So that's good. Then I can look at the inner product of, you know, this vector with itself. That's going to be just z1 star z1. That's going to be modulus of z1 squared, which is a positive definite quantity. So that's a, that's a check. And also we have the third, uh, uh, which is the distributive law, which also holds, right? All readily verified. So this is a legitimate uh, scalar product. Note that we could have tried to do some something more complicated, like try to define the um, scalar product as the real part of z1 star z2. And this is not going to work out, right? So the reason is, if you take the inner product of z1 and z2, uh, it's going to be a real number here. And then you, it, its complex conjugate needs to be uh, the inner product of z2, z1. And this is not going to work out. You can check this. Right, so not everything which will be some function of z1 and z2 or you know of two vectors that you can think of will be a legitimate uh, le legitimate definition for a scalar product. Right, but, but there are more, there's, there's definitely more than one way of doing it. There are multiple ways of doing it, but you have to carefully check this, and then you have to be consistent with your discussion. Right, so many a time that kind of vector spaces we will deal with, the notion of scalar product will be there will be a natural definition for it, right? Like with Euclidean vectors, right? We have a natural definition, but although there also one can come up with other ways of defining a scalar product, right? So we might look at some examples at a later time, but I'm just telling you that the, uh, the definition of scalar product 
doesn't constrain it to be just you know one particular function there are more than one there's more than one way of doing it as long as those three properties hold so let's look at complex n column vectors we could identify a vector x you know with a column vector like this you have n complex numbers these are all the coefficients and then we could define the scalar product of two vectors x and y as inner product of x y is equal to x dagger y right so so this bra vector can be thought of as a column vector right so whenever you have a ket vector it's like a you know a, a column vector whereas the bra vector is a row vector right so so there's a column vector as far as this y is concerned whereas the bra vector is a row vector right so that's why you have this x dagger operation and it's straightforward to verify that you know all these properties required by inner product a whole okay so that's um, that's all for now in this lecture we will see some consequences of these as we go along starting from the next lecture thank you